Hello everybody, welcome to Lido Fine Art. If you're new, welcome. If you've been here before, welcome back. So today's video, we are going to be talking about the Night Stalker, aka Richard Ramirez. And this is going to be a two-part video series. And the first part, we will be talking about his background, who he was, what he did, and then we're going to go into the psychology of it all. Part two, we will be talking about the demonology part of it. So without further ado, here we go. So who was Richard Ramirez? Richard R Ramirez was an American serial killer who murdered at least 14 people and raped and tortured at least two dozen more, mostly during the spring and summer of 1985. He became a heavy drug user and developed an interest in Satanism after being afflicted with epilepsy due to several head injuries as a child. He left behind drawn pentagrams at one of the crime scenes in addition to footprints in various killing patterns which became major clues for investigators to identifying who he was. At first, investigators found it difficult to rule all these murders under one serial killer since each murder and attack were somewhat different from the last. However, his shoe print was left at almost every single crime scene. For victims who were able to escape, many indicated that the killer had told them to swear to Satan instead of God. So there is a little pattern there with that. Now one of his victims, Erickson, she's one of them that actually survived, she was able to make it to the window and saw the car Ramirez was driving. She was able to give a description of both Ramirez and his orange Toyota station wagon. The teenager later identified the car from news reports and wrote down half of its license plate number. The stolen car was found on August 28th and police were able to obtain one fingerprint that was on the mirror of the vehicle. The prints belong to one Richard Munoz Ramirez, who was described as a 25-year-old drifter from Texas with a long rap sheet that included many arrests for traffic and illegal drug violations. Two days later, his mugshot, his mugshots were broadcasted on national television and printed on the cover of every major newspaper in California. The next day, Ramirez was identified, surrounded, and severely beaten by an angry mob in East Los Angeles as he was trying to steal a car. Police had to break up the mob to prevent them from killing Ramirez. Alright, so I'm not going to go into his um, victims and what he did to them because I feel like it might just be too much like graphic and I don't know but yeah so the trial and conviction jury selection for the case started on July 22nd 1988 and on September 20th 1989 he was found guilty of 13 counts of murder five attempted murders 11 sexual assaults and 14 burglaries during the penalty phase of the trial on November 7th 1989 he was sentenced to die in California's gas chamber. The trial of Richard Ramirez was one of the most difficult and longest criminal trials in American history. He is also famous for the pentagram drawing on his hand that he revealed during part of the trial. Nearly 1,600 prospective jurors were interviewed. More than 100 witnesses testified, and while a number of witnesses had a difficult time recalling certain facts four years after the crimes, others were quite certain of the identity of Richard Ramirez. All right. So now we're going to get into his background background, like his childhood, because I feel like this is very important into why he did the things that he did. 
All right. So, Ramirez was born Ricardo Leva Munoz Ramirez on February 29, 1960 in El Paso, Texas. The fifth child of Mexican immigrants Mercedes and Julian Ramirez, known as Richard or Rickard, wow, Richard or Ricky uh, Ramirez, reportedly sustained multiple head injuries at an early age. After he was knocked unconscious by a swing at age five, he began experiencing epileptic fits. As an adolescent, Ramirez was heavily influenced by his older cousin, Miguel, who had recently returned from fighting in the Vietnam War. The two smoked marijuana together as Miguel told Ramirez about the torture and mutilation he had inflicted on several Vietnamese women. Corroborating these stories with photographic evidence, at age 13, Ramirez witnessed his cousin murder his wife. Dropping out of school in the ninth grade, Ramirez was arrested for the first time in 1977 for marijuana possession. He soon moved to California, progressing to cocaine addiction and burglary and cultivating an interest in Satanism. He was arrested twice in the Los Angeles area for auto theft in 1981 and again in 1984 and noticeably began to neglect his personal hygiene. Prior to his criminal convictions, Mr. Ramirez had a criminal record from his youth that had begun that had began with petty crimes such as robberies in 1977, placing him in juvenile detention. Years later, Mr. Ramirez engaged in criminal acts such as burglary and car theft in 1983, which led to a sentence in jail where he was released in April eight. Yeah, wow, in April 1984. Now. One thing I forgot to note in there is that he was abused by his father, which is also very important. So let's go into the psychology of it all. Mr. Ramirez's social history has exhibited persistent patterns of exposure of criminal behavior and violence. At an early age, Mr. Ramirez was exposed to an abusive nature as his father was abusive. <clears throat> During his childhood, Mr. Ramirez was influenced by his older cousin, Miguel, which had told and shown pictures of violent acts that he acquired while serving in the Vietnamese War. Introduced Mr. Ramirez to drugs and had killed his wife in the presence of Mr. Ramirez. As an adolescent, Mr. Ramirez moved to San Francisco, then Los Angeles. While residing in San Francisco and Los Angeles, he had continued petty theft crimes to fuel his drug addiction as he then used cocaine and LSD, which led Mr. Ramirez in an interest of Satanism. With being exposed to violence and crime, Mr. Ramirez dropped out of high school and ventured into criminal acts. All right. Conduct disorder. According to the Diagnosis and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorder, um, pretty much the DSM manual, conduct disorder refers to a repetitive and persistent pattern of behavior in which the basic rights of others or a major age-appropriate societal norms or rules are violated. In order to be diagnosed with conduct disorder, at least three of the following 15 criteria must be shown within 12 months with at least one characteristic present within six months. Oh, and side note, you guys. None of this information is my own. I will list the sources in the video, but also in the description box down below. So, yes, 
Now let's get on with the 15 criteria. Number one, bullies, threatens, or intimidates others. Number two, often initiates physical fights. Three, has used a weapon that can seriously cause physical harm to others. Four, has been physically cruel to people. Five, has been physically cruel to animals. Six, has stolen while confronting victim. Seven, has forced someone into sexual activity. Eight, deliberately engaging in fire setting with intention of causing serious damage. Number nine, destroyed others' properties other than fire setting. Number 10, broken into someone else's house, building, or car. 11, often lies to obtain goods, favors, or to avoid obligations. 12, stolen items of non-trivial value without confronting the victim. 13, staying out at night despite parental prohibitions. 14, runs away from home overnight at least twice while living with a guardian or once without returning for a lengthy period of time. And 15, is often missing from school. Based on the details of Mr. Ramirez's report and the diagnosis of conduct disorder, that Mr. Ramirez does acquire the symptoms of the mental illness. Mr. Ramirez exhibits 10 out of the possible symptoms listed above. During childhood and adolescent years, Mr. Ramirez would often have often dealt with using drugs with his older cousin, Miguel, and Miss dropped out of school to pursue a life of crime. With all of his victims, Mr. Ramirez has displayed violent intentions by intimidating, torturing, and sexually assaulting his victims before physically harming or killing them with either a knife or a gun. In assaulting and murdering his victims, Mr. Ramirez would initially engage in burglarizing his victims' houses and cars. Now we are going to go through the psychopathy checklist revised PCL-R. The definition of psychopathy can be defined as persuasive emotional and interpersonal deficits, impulsive, impulsivity, and antisocially. To measure psychopathy on an individual, the use of psychological instrument called a Psychopathy Checklist Revised is used as it assesses the characteristics of psychopathy. By reviewing any reports, interviews, or various sources of the individual to determine their level of psychopathy. During the assessment of the PCL-R, it is comprised of two factors. The first factor, or factor one, is comprised of the interpersonal and affective characteristics of psychopathy. The second factor, or factor two, reflects more on the antisocial characteristics of the individual. The total of characteristics being applied are 12 with six characteristics in both factors. On a point system of 0 to 2, a score of 18 and over out of 24 will determine that the individual has psychopathy. A score that is 12 or under will determine that the individual is a non-psychopath. As a result of the PCL-R assessment, Mr. Ramirez had scored a 9 out of a possible 12 in factor 1 and scored a 9 out of a possible 12 in factor 2. In conclusion, Mr. Ramirez, in their professional opinion, meets the criteria of being a psychopath in the assessment of the PCL-R. Relevant Psychological Function 
based on Mr. Ramirez's criminal history and the early exposure of violent and criminal life events, the most relevant theory for understanding his criminal behavior is the trauma control model. Trauma control model argues that with the combination of predisposition, wow, I can't talk today, the predispositional factors such as biological, sociological, and psychological factors and early traumatic events interact with other factors over the individual's life may determine their criminal psychopathy. At a young age, Mr. Ramirez witnessed his cousin, Miguel, kill his wife, which may have increased his development of psychopathy and with being surrounded with criminal and violent um, influences, it could have increasingly developed his psychopathy even more when Mr. Ramirez started to use drugs such as cocaine and LSD. Relating trauma control model to Mr. Ramirez's history by residing in an environment that had engaged with criminal, violent, and drug abuse activities, it increased the development of psychopathy. So, yeah, that is the psychological analysis of Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. Um, so I'm going to end it there with that, especially because my voice is starting to go. <laughs> but yeah, so what do you guys think about that? Please leave your thoughts, comments, whatever you got going. On, just share them down below I am curious to see what you guys have to say but yeah thank you guys for watching or listening if you're not watching the um, time-lapse but yeah thank you guys for watching and I hope to see you guys with part two next week so yeah peace out everybody